Hello, it's uh, just gone past seven o'clock here in Queensland, nine o'clock in New Zealand, and ten o'clock for our friends and followers over in the UK. And um, as you can see, there's um, some of our fairy fans, wool, <laughs> bit robust there in the reptilian family. <clears throat> but um, the reason that we've got those. Uh, genre of um, animals is um, none other than our special guest, um, Greg Bushell. Greg, I've met three years ago down the Gold Coast. He actually lives on the Gold Coast. And um, it's quite a unique character. And I, I, I believe it deserves recognition, and that's why we've brought Greg on tonight. And um, Julie's going to come in shortly. So um, people have probably seen the shows of Richard um harrison right dr doodle and then of course um later on it was played by um what's his name he played again dr doodle the other fellow mm. he's a guy um so the point is that um we've got our own just here on the gold coast and it's a special gift that um i've, I've honestly feel that's why greg's here tonight so, Greg, um, welcome, mate, and thanks for coming, eh? Yeah, my pleasure, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so it's been three years in the making uh, since we last spoke on the radio, and this time it's a more visual approach. Um, okay, it's, it's a latent gift that you got, and I'm quite sure a lot of people would understand we've all got different gifts. It's just a matter of some of it's been suppressed over time. But how did yours come to the forefront? How, how did you get through all that bullying and, and all the other things that come with it? Or you, know, you keep it closed, you don't say anything, but you just have this innate ability to be able to communicate with animals. Yeah, how did that come about? Well, it started basically um, about 30 years ago when I was um, going through a divorce and thought there must have been more to life than um, uh, the family that, just kind of left my life so i uh and my first girlfriend after my uh, marriage breakup was a reiki master so i was keeping company with her and she said to me if you want to keep going out with me you've got to learn reiki yourself so just to keep the peace so to speak in the relationship uh i spent a weekend and and learned reiki and and that was the beginning of um my so-called connection to healing and um, spiritual matters. And uh, it came about, I was at a mate's house and he said to me, uh, it's costing him a fortune to keep his poor dog alive. It's um, got some form of cancer. And he said, try some of that uh, Reiki rubbish that you do on my dog and see if it works. So what happened, I ended up in the garage with the dog and he sat on my lap and and I got this um, almost like a, uh, a uh, somebody talking to me and he said, I'll stay with you for 10 minutes today, but come back tomorrow and I'll, I'll be with you for nine minutes. So I actually looked at the clock in the, in the garage and after 10 minutes, blow me down, the, the dog actually moved away and wouldn't come back. So it just so happened I was free the next day and I came back and blow me down, I was exactly after nine minutes he went again and this continued on for uh, three more visits in the next following three days and after about after about the fifth or sixth visit I got he said to me I've actually I'm healed and his face actually changed he looked like a healthy dog and from then on I knew that was basically in a an awakening for myself that could unfold and just as things happen, um, from then on, it would always, the consequences, people would bring sick animals to me or or want to know certain things about their animals. And it just unfolded from there. So, so a little um, expose here, of, um, let's put them back up. Yeah. You obviously had a quite a menage of different animals, obviously from horses to cows to greyhounds to fish, I suppose. I don't know, yeah. you tell me. Yeah, I think that every one of those animals there I've um, usually met as pets in a household. 
Um, I know about the guy on the far right. I'm not even sure what it is, but I haven't met one of those chaps. But um, there was uh, only recently in a house here on the Gold Coast, um, a chap had a house full of snakes. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. And he'd keep them in these so-called big individual plastic boxes. Um, he was very concerned about them, but none of them gave a, a so-called um, positive um, response to how they were being so-called treated. They really missed their, their vibration of the outside world, the trees and the touch of the, the so-called... Um, the bark and the trees around their uh, cells. Hmm. So they're obviously a sensory type of animal by cruising across the you know, the dirt and the leaf forage and all that stuff, and then, as you say, the trees themselves and the vibration, which um, a, a lot of humans find when they've um, taken their shoes and socks off and they're walking along the beach or just run along through muddy puddles, you, you seem to get pretty grounded, don't you? So there's something to be said for the, the snake letting you know that yeah well they're all slightly different but none of them said that they're in they're in actual bliss that was just they were there with love for this chap i mean there was love there was a great connection between them all but they all missed their so-called native environment and, and i've spoken to him since and he has actually let them all go he uh, you really yeah. 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 He's moved along, which was. That's pretty profound, that, mate. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was good. So, um, coming back to the actual communication with the animals, I mean, is that something that you hear that little voice um, in the head, or is it just a sensory, or is it a feeling, or is it just you just get an image there that you know most um, people actually get it. You know, Einstein used to talk about imagination, the power of imagination. So you get pictures or symbology or, or how does your communication work? Uh, funny thing, I just get words and the words come out. Just It's just an energy. And I just say whatever as I look into the animal. Once I connect to the animal, usually they come forth with an opening statement. For example, um, they enjoyed their breakfast. Please give me more um, meat for, for my meals. Uh, but quite often it's about especially when they're pets they're very much talking about those in the household and uh, and basically probably 80 85 percent of when people bring pets to me and it's normally because it's it's that when they're completely frustrated by the vet that they can't get fixed that they come to me and 85 percent of the time it's about them themselves not necessarily the animal and it's very, very much common that once the, the animal has brought their owner to me and had their situation so-called looked into, that the animal immaculately gets well. I they, see. Yeah. So what you're saying is the animal goes out in empathy with the owner and, and um, shows you the, the mirror of the actual owner itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. 85% of the time. So true. So you, effectively, you're actually healing the actual the human. Yeah, yes, that's right. The animals bring the humans, and we <laughs> assist the humans. Yeah. Especially in the, this is we're talking about the pet concept, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, I remember being in the UK at a um, big festival in Somerset, and um, the lady brought a corn snake, and she came to me and she said, "I, oh, you've seen plenty of snakes in Australia." And I said, "No, not really." It's quite remarkable. <laughs> you only see him at the bloody zoo or something, you know. Anyway, yeah. um, she said, look, I've just got to go and get some um, aromatherapy oils um, yeah. because there is a problem with the snake. I said, oh, radio. She mm -hmm. said, I'm going to go and see this lady um, who's got a stall down there in the market. I said, yeah, right. Can you hold the snake? I said, yeah, no problem. Yeah. So she brought the snake and it came up to my arm here. Yeah. Like that. And uh, <clears throat> this electric shock. I could, everybody saw it. it was a blue a blue um lightning just went boom hit that snake and um and i thought to be perfectly honest as i speak to you I, I just thought it was you know kinetic energy you know you get when you go to a car and you get that little shock you know yeah. well it was a bit bigger than that and the snake just boom, wouldn't come anywhere near me and um 
He says, oh, my God, it's never happened before. I said, well, it's never happened to me too. So um, <laughs> so they gave it to the snake for someone else, and then she raced off and got all these little essential oils. And then um, yeah. it was really remarkable. I, I'm, I'm just seeing if this is something that you, you do as well, because this lady then did um, muscle testing. And so she got the owner of the snake and um, yeah. you know, put the hand out. <laughs> is your name, you know, Greg? <clears throat> of course not. It's, you know, it's a woman's name. And yeah. finally, she, she got that whole aspect of of the owner of the snake. And mm. once she had that muscle testing, then she got the snake come to the actual owner and they made the connection. And then she did this thing. Oh, it's truly remarkable. And it was actually um, peppermint oil that was the um, requirement for the snake. Yeah. Gosh. Gee, there's some talented people out there, isn't there? So talented. Yeah. Well, you know, you obviously seen muscle testing. I don't know if any of our listeners or people watching know about muscle testing, but it's, mm. it's quite a, quite an interesting technique for healing. Most certainly, yeah. It's something I really have know very little about, and it's not my cup of tea. But it sounds fantastic. Okay, so look, the show's not about me. It's yours, yours, Greg. Yes. So, okay, so um, someone's listening to the show. Um, they can get hold of you. You know, obviously through the Facebook site that I've just put up now. Um, yeah. Obviously, you're on the Gold Coast here in Queensland, so people can either um, get hold of you on Facebook from other countries. Um, yeah. They can speak to you. Okay, so, um, and, and obviously, people could come and see you and make an appointment. Uh, yeah. How long does an appointment go for? Uh, usually an hour, but always with a dash of flexibility. You know, yeah. Usually one hour covers everything. And one hour, yeah. And usually we do the opening statement of the, of the animal and then I ask the owners or whoever's present to ask whatever questions they wish of the animal. And, uh, okay. and yeah, usually an hour or so is perfect. And it's just, just the one session or you, you just get a feeling on the on the day whether it's going to be two or three or four? Or... Yeah, yeah, you, you never know, yeah, yeah. If there's, if there's um, healing to be done or other so-called energies that have to be involved it, it all comes out and people people are advised accordingly and then it's up to them if they follow up or not but usually usually one or two solves a problem oh, um, right, okay. uh, other times if the animals are ill uh usually they don't have to come back i just do it i'll send to them of an evening i usually each night there's usually three or four different animals i send to and and get a feedback from the owners every few days how they're traveling so, so if you're um so some people say you're sending the absent healing or someone would say that you're sending a prayer to them or some would say that you're asking saint francis of assisi or someone to just go there and help in the yeah. healing of that particular animal yeah yeah basically well, i always work through reiki through me um Tibetan Reiki symbols, and um, and that usually gets the desired results. And we we begin there, and then we whatever comes forth on top of that, we pass messages on or experiences, whatever whatever comes up, we pass it across to the owners. And and usually there's there's significant change in the animal or the situation that that has been brought forth to be looked at. The reason that they brought the animal to us in the first place so um apart from having a, a session on the radio here um how do how do people come to know that you exist greg uh for a while there i had a, a website um it's just of late i haven't i'm not very brilliant with the computer side of things and the person that was helping me she's moved on so i've just left it via um People, due to my old website and word of mouth, they still find me. I still do a little bit each week with regards to the animal communications. Well, I just think it's important um, in this in this time where we're talking about consciousness. You, know, um, you can either stay home or you can get out, and you certainly um, you certainly get out there. And most people would think, "Oh my God!" But until you bring it into mainstream and, and be part of our society, then, you know, that's where the acceptance comes from, isn't it? Yeah, of course. When, um, I do um, a lot of meditation classes each week and and I find that a lot of people who come to those classes, they're very much 
looking into the animal communication side of things and they're slowly getting there through the depths of meditation and a willingness to want to be able to communicate with with animals i mean um, humanity probably saw uh, robert redford with that movie uh, horse whisperer took it to another level and probably once those little thoughts sort of come in there and it goes into through the cinematic landscape um someone like yourself can then pop up and say look i'm here i'm here yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i didn't see the movie but yeah um at one stage there i used i went to a lot of the vets here and um asked them if they needed some someone like myself but i didn't get any any positive feedback in actual fact there was one uh, one particular vet i walked into and the lady and i was explaining to the vet what i did and there was a lady there and she said um do you mind if you tell me what the the vet has done to my cat and the poor vet he went red in the face and left the room immediately <laughs> so I thought, so with diplomacy leading the way i, I suggested that I, I best not say a word because apparently what he had suggested was not exactly what had occurred so so we left it at that and we all left all oh, right okay yeah, yeah. but um not su i'm suggesting that vets aren't like that it was just this one instance and 99.99 percent of them are absolutely fabulous absolutely fabulous and the, the way they do their work and carry out their process hmm. um my good mate julia's um tapped in now so um hi sorry sorry about being late no no you're all good you don't have to apologize yeah hi yeah. hi Julie. hi greg hi everyone that's listening yeah greg i'm really excited to um be hearing hearing your story and um a lot of the younger people are really into rescuing animals because they just can't bear the thought of them being locked up in in, in industrial lots etc mm. and i mean i i think those they do certainly sense the pain and i've also had friends who've lived near abattoirs and um they they could just feel the pain that's not imagined is it definitely not definitely not in actual fact i um i do visit different houses and assist them with cleansing and clearing and quite often it's the it is a result of of abattoirs or killing of animals was certainly carried on in that area and the energy is still there unless you move through it and direct it to leave but so much of the earth is soiled with the energies of um animals being killed mm, very much so so there are energies of pain and suffering yes absolutely it's in the soil it's in the it's a, it's a vibration that surrounds that part of the earth because mm. because i mean i think you know sometimes you know i think sometimes we try and reason that it's okay you know especially in australia where the cows you know live a fairly good life before they end up in the mm. slaughterhouse and um, some people say that you know the animal souls actually agree to 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 serve humans and and to you know that this is what they're doing willingly what what you know what would your opinion be of that uh, I, I do understand in the majority of cases, like most animals in the wild, they they understand that they are part of the food chain and they do understand that, that their gift of giving themselves to maybe another animal or to man in some cases is part of their so-called life. Um, however, it does not change the vibration of the earth where the so-called abattoirs exist or did exist especially those um oh what do you call those jolly they, they, they used to make the cows jump into the uh the, the water full of the anti uh everything what oh gosh can't think of the word you mean for the dip? yeah that's dip. it thank, thank you yeah the cattle dip they're, they're also areas that have just to lift the the vibration of the area where they existed is also very very difficult very difficult and uh, yeah yeah so and, what kind of what what do you do to lift the area of a vibration are you dousing or are you bringing in 
using the Tibetan healing method or how, how do you do that? Uh, if I came up like upon somebody who had built near or upon an ex um, abattoir, it would be a lot of constant meditations bringing in vibrations of light and perfection via the angelic realm. And this would, it does not happen overnight. It would very much include the people who are living there. Um, it may well be that they've been brought to that area for that exact reason to change the vibration of that section of Mother Earth to bring it alive and back back to light. And it would be a combination of depending on how the situation that was left via the by the um, killing fields that you just wouldn't know how long it would take. could take months. could take months. But eventually we can bring it back with determination and the right people. Hmm. And things will change. Hmm. So do you feel, you know, I mean, uh, my friends who are psychics, they'll sort of say that um, there's not that big a percentage of humans who are psychics are, you know, every sort of human ghost in the area will generally come and look for, for a human who can actually understand them and hang out with them whether they like it or not. Do you have something similar with the animals that they kind of work out that you you could hear them, you can talk to them, and they start following you around or waiting for you to come out of your house so that they can get your help or assistance? That's an interesting question. Um, uh, no, I think, you know, I think that most animals have these conversations with anybody and everybody, and it's only a relative few that can can understand what they're, what they're about. Um, I, I certainly don't think that they wait for me, but they wait for somebody with similar ability to myself to bring forth whatever message they want to transmit. And as we said, 85% of the time it's about their owners. We're obviously talking about pets, people's pets, not in the wild type of situation. Amazing, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Yeah, it might even be higher than 85%. It's just, it's every, everyone. And let's face it, as they say, everybody's going through something and the animals are not usually very much aware of it and they're there for a reason in a household. And quite often it says mum, dad and three kids, um, even though the animal may have a so-called um, inkling for one of the one of one person in the house, they are very much aware of the other so-called four people. They know where they are. They understand the so-called energy they they transmit by just walking from one room to another. And and then it comes across the animals themselves. Their different awakenings in themselves. They don't all. They're a bit like humans. Some are smarter than others, so to speak. There's um. And, and some have, for example, uh, professional people have usually an animal, no matter how silly or whatever they look, they're usually so often on a par with the workings of that particular professional person. Is that mm. right? Yeah, very much so. So what about, what about the lordship of the cat? <laughs> the, the cat. Yeah, yeah, I mean, cats, they just seem to have their own royal wave, isn't it? You know, like, yeah, well, you... well cat, sorry. Yeah, I thought you saw my cat, it just ran past. I oh, know, yes. I know, I just saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, arrived, yeah. It's, it's difficult to, Dusty's in a world of her own. She, um, the other day, in a, in a bowl of milk where I left it, she drank a milk and left an absolute perfect G in the bottom of the bowl. My neighbour come and said, "How did you draw that letter G in the bottom of the milk container?" And it was a letter G. So <laughs> this is what well, it's you know amazing. Why? Why would just she just lets me know that she's here assisting. I bring animals into the yard and she stays and watches and growls and carries on, but she's always on the ball watching. Hmm. And in the background shot, I've got um, some cattle there in the farms. Do you, you get phone calls to go out into the uh, farm estates, country areas? Um, 
I haven't had a great deal to do with cattle in the so-called paddocks. I've had a couple of people who've had pet cows and they've been the most loving, perfect vibration animals, even more, even more, in some cases, more connected than intelligent dogs. They're very, very switched on, beautiful. Um, a lot of times you go to the farms and they, they bring forth an energy as one. And it's like if there's 30 cows in the yard, um, the voice comes through as one. And the energy of whatever it is, they don't, they, it's almost like they don't have the experience of a, a pet, but they have the experience of existence of their connection to the love of their so-called food and they understand they're part of a chain was what I've found with regards to um, herds of so-called um, semi-wild animals. Hmm. So with the um, recent drought and the bushfires, um, did you find that the animals were picking up on that and restless or warning and trying to get, get our attention before all that happened? Basically, I, I, I didn't have a great connection into that side of things, to be honest. Um, I understood that via the, the pain and suffering that occurred during the bushfires, there was very much um, a real sadness, a downness to what was existing. But I, I, I must admit, I never truly went, I understood that Mother Earth was, excuse, excuse me, um, in some cases uh, bringing a balance of what may or should or should not have occurred and it was just sadness. It was sad. Um, but I never, I never actually went into those areas of destruction, to be honest. Yeah. I was in Germany at the time and, um, you know, everybody in Europe was, um, you know, just they were, they were so upset and so sad for the animals, all the animals that had died. Mm. And um, it was really interesting because um, we have problems with the Great Barrier Reef in terms of putting on sunscreen, but, you know, you go to Europe and they're advertising sunscreen that's safe for the Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> of course. There's not much yeah. awareness of that. It's, it's, uh... No. So what's the, yeah. like, most evolved animal that you've ever met and maybe i don't know i had a philosophical conversation with or got told what to do by you know one that seemed to be you know sort of the most advanced and evolved uh that's an interesting question probably um uh then again it's um professional people or so-called professional people or, or maybe healers healers themselves reiki masters and those who just follow those lines uh, the animals are very much want to be part of the healing process and they bring forth an energy into the room that um, allows the healer to maybe get into the the depth of where they're meant to be um, it's also um there, i had a interesting chap the other day he was um he actually brought his animal over from england with him and uh and he was a um he i think he, he does interviews with people via the computer and and it was this animal talking to him it was like talking to a um a computer expert almost it was really and he, and he'd been with his owner for about 10 years yeah he, he, he just knew what to what was coming forth during the interviews um and this man i think he was he used to interview sports people and uh he was this he, this dog was amazing he was truly he was um he knew that almost the, the whole life story of this particular sportsman that they were interviewing and uh it was a yeah there's there really are some amazing animals out there they might look like animals but they're a bit smarter than me i know that and i think that's sometimes that's what we sometimes suspect isn't it that um and some people have said that you know a part of a soul might come in and help us 
a spirit guide and, you know, basically dress up as an animal yeah. just in order to be able to help us. Well, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm, I, I haven't ventured along that path, I'm, but I wouldn't. People smarter than myself would understand that, but I'm not quite there with regards to that. So what was the what was the first animal that that you 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 presumably missed the most? If, it, if it, I mean it might still be there with you in spirit, but you know that made the deepest impact on you in terms of really learning respect for animals as uh, living, intelligent, loving beings. Yeah, probably the, the very first one, Rosie. It was a uh, a, um, a golden retriever, and she was the one when I sat in the garage for five days in a row, whatever it was, and and each day became. And to begin with, she just looked normal, and by the end of the the week, she actually she just looked so clear and pure. It was just, and that was probably the one I always remember. Um, other times there's so often you get called to places where the question is, is my animal ready to go? It's been ill or, you know, it's 15 years old and is the animal ready to go to heaven, so to speak? And a lot of times the stories that the animal pass on to the owners with regards to the experiences, the emotions that they've lived every minute with the owners, with the household, with the family. They've seen the little ones grow up to be adults and and that's always very touching to see that. And the, and the joy of the actual owner, so-called taking them to the vet and letting them go. That's probably the most rewarding of the work I do, just letting the animal go when the time is right. Hmm. That they've had enough and they've finished their so-called work that they had to do and just let me go home and and um, recharge the batteries. Hmm. And, and usually, quite often, they will suggest that... Um, another animal of possible similar energy will join the family and take th this animal's place it's ready to go to heaven and and they always say well quite often they say i'm the old so-called old school let the new energy come into the household and bring the new vibration into the household that it's ready to that it deserves and ready to experience mm. Yeah. So, Greg, have you ever, um, I mean, I've um, got the horses in the background, but um, yeah. we're talking about land animals. Have you been drawn to the water and, and particularly um, whales that have been coming past, you know, the Gold Coast over these last few years? Do you get a feeling or calling to go to whales or um, turtles or orcas or sharks or um, you know, dolphins? Or? Um, no, strangely enough, no. I, I did apply once for a job at SeaWorld, but they rejected. <laughs> I think I was quite, quite, a, quite. Didn't think they quite wanted somebody like me there. But um, no, I haven't once. I for weekends after weekend, myself and a friend would, uh, she do all the riding, and we did. I did go in the water and connect with fish, yeah. and fish, yeah, wild fish, and they they came forth as a conglomerate as a there was a school of fish that came and surrounded me and they came forth um, in a similar energy. It's They're completely different. I find a completely different energy to so-called um, horses, cats, um, oh, well, things that don't live in the water. Um, and they were, they were very uh, peaceful. They were also, they speak as a part of a food chain, like they, don't suggest that they're going to live to be 80 years old. They're just part of the existence and a vibration of energy. And same with the same day, there was crabs, were little crabs on the beach. And they're kind of an excitable little energy. Um, and they come through as as speaking in fast motion. So, but, but also um, they speak, if there's eight there, they kind of come through as one. There's no so-called individual chats to be had. 
and it's more or less just to talk about their their existence their life and they yeah they don't actually get into detail not to me anyway no ah, sounds like you're dealing with the borg <laughs> sorry yeah sounds like you're listening to the borg from from star trek isn't it resistance oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. hey um because I've noticed that Kitchi Madelaide there a couple of weeks ago, we were just walking on the beach and all of a sudden, whack, up out of the um, sand came all those blue soldier crabs. It was really yeah. quite a surreal um, feeling of seeing them all just pop out of the thing and scurry along. And then, like a hundred of them at a time. It's just, yeah, well, they're, they're the ones who, who communicate as one, but you don't see many of them around anymore, do you? Not in the popular beaches anyway. Too many no. feet, I think. Too many no, footsteps. They, so, Greg, walk me through talking to the crabs eti etiquette. Do you kind of go, hi, crab? <laughs> 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 Who goes there? <laughs> What's the etiquette? Do they sort of reach in? Is there sort of, you know, with humans, you kind of have to engage and sort of decide you're going to talk and shake hands and then. Yeah, it, I don't know. You just, I suppose you look at them and, and they just, they're just there and they vibrate. They give through a vibration to start with, and oh. they and they come through is very quick. Like they're almost as if they're running late in their chatter. You know, like when we talk really fast, if we're running late to try and get a message across before we've got to go. Oh, and really? that's, yeah, they chat, 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 and and it's it's not it's not nothing deep and meaningful. It's all just energy. It's it's peace, peace, and and. Yeah, it's it's energy, not much more than communicating with an energy, with regards to crabs. To the best of my knowledge, that's. So it's like solidarity, I'm, is it? Yeah, look, it's it's peace. Um, I've only communicated with the little fellas that live on the beach. Not even the one that uh, Jeff spoke to. Not really. It's just the in, it's individual the ones. Okay. Yeah, like this. These little groups of three and four. There's one will come up, and then another one, and you can. And there's another one over there. They're all there. They're all in their little family type setups. But, but there's nothing really profound that I could get from them anyway. It's just in existence, and they're in peace. They're living their world. They're doing what they want. Hmm. So, which Without, animals at the moment would you say are most not in peace? The ones that you've spoken to, you know, rather than what the news or news reflects to us i used to go out to um a place called the crystal cottage at Corumban valley oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. um i used to go there every sunday and people would bring their animals and they'd line up and we'd have our chats and whatever and they're pretty diplomatic the animals they never i only i was sitting there this day and there was a break there was no one around and this dog came up it was a little black dog and um and he came up and sat on the on my lap, and I said, oh, "Most unusual from to be so." And there was nobody there, no owner. And he showed me a boot, a big Wellington boot, and he said, and he was shaking with fear. And mm. and with that, he just took off. And the owner of the property at the stage, going back a few years, I said, "Oh, who owns that dog?" And she said, "Oh, that's owned by so so and so who lives down the road." And he's not such a an animal lover. And exactly what the dog he just said he's not being treated very well. But that was the end of it. I never saw him again. He never came back again. Yeah. But he just explained that obviously not everybody treats their animals as as we would, you know. Hmm. Hey, mate, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we used to get some um, people used to bring their horses. That was always used to love the horses. And um, every net, I get a few horses go in nearby, and a lot of people ring up with regards to so-called problems with their horses. And is it really a problem? But and it usually turns out they want to change the address. Uh, the horses want to change the address. They, a lot of people, they go to these so-called um, when you rent. A, an area of land for the horse. I can't think of the name of what adjust, they do. Yeah, adjust. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, adjusting. And so often what you see is not exactly the energy that the horses need. 
uh, quite often it's in especially in the country we spoke about those cattle tick ex cattle tick places etc yep. and and they're scattered around the place and and you look, what may look like a beautiful green paddock is actually toxic it's not good at all and um and so the animals usually react unusually and the owners pick it up and then call on someone like myself and want to know why of course why their beautiful horse which is all, all of a sudden wants to won't doesn't want anybody on their back and etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's either and then um there was one the other day there was a outcrop of a particular grass that was not conducive to this particular animal and they put it together that it, that grass was not perfect so there's always reasons why the animals um are ready to move on mm. so many different reasons <laughs> there was another one early days this um this horse she said the lady got me out to this property back in mount tambourine somewhere and said all of a sudden my horse is so so sad it just she said I don't, she said, I reckon I can communicate a little bit with my horse and my horse is sad. Why is the horse so sad? And the horse said, I'm missing my mate. And I said to the lady, well, he's missing his mate. She said, he's never had a mate. And I said, well, what's changed? And there was a, an old car wreck in the paddock that had been the horse's mate. And she said, yeah, he'd loved and they'd just moved the, the old car wreck um, because it was old and rusty. And it was all about the horse was attracted to the, and she said, yeah, all the time he'd rub up against the old car wreck. So what she did, she went and bought another wreck and put it in, in the yard. Oh, in the yeah, and I came back, <laughs> came back a month's time and um, he was 90% happy. It wasn't exactly the same, but he was 90% happy that he had his, his mate, something he could, I assume, scratch and rub himself against, you know. Yeah, so it doesn't always have to be other animals that they so-called connect with, you know. They've got their their um, things they look forward to, even if it's an old car wreck, you know. Yeah. And then there was another one. Um, no, I won't tell you that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, go on, go on. No, no, no. <laughs> no. No, I'll think of another one. There's, I've got a book with hundreds of men. They're all different, you know, like yeah. They're just amazing different reasons why animals um and they get connected to certain members of the family like they um certain horses have an energy for for example um men and others they connect better with so-called young females teenagers or or older women or it, it's each animal seems to a bit like you know us to a degree what who they um vibrate perfectly with um yeah but logistics are always excuse me always uh, a question of will my animal like this particular area and usually they have to go to the area and experience experience the neighbors who are who are also obviously other animals in the logistical area and uh and it's like us sometimes we like our neighbors sometimes we do sometimes we don't um there was one uh one not long ago the horse was um the question was is the horse happy in this new area it's had double the space that it had previously um but it was beside a house that was um full of partying young people and the horse couldn't was not into that side of the which the horse would never go near that side of the paddock and that's why the lady asked why is why is he always over there on the other well away from the houses and the reason why it was the music and um other energies that were in that house hmm. yeah. so the horse picks up on it and, yeah I mean, I'll just go back to, to something that you mentioned earlier, Greg, because I've often yeah. wondered about this. And you said that, um, you know, some of the most intelligent or most advanced um, or insightful animals, animals that you've worked, worked with the ones who are aligned with the um, professions of their owners. Yeah. And um, 
I know that animals, you know, when you study their brains and their eyes and their senses, that they actually access different um, fields than we do. You know, we all know that dogs can and uh, bats can hear and sense things that humans can't, etc. And 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 um, presumably, each animal has it has it kind of its own kind of um, spectrum and energies that it, it tunes into and, and is probably aligned with that humans um, can't experience with with our current biological makeup. Hmm. Uh, so is it, is there like a purpose, you know, like the horses are there and they're connecting into a certain type of energy, whereas, you know, bats are connecting in with another and frogs are connecting in with another. Everybody's like humans are meant to be guardians, but do the animals also have a role in their biosphere apart from the usual food chain? And maintenance kind of thing um to be honest i i don't know mainly um my connections have been with animals with pets um mm. and they always seem to choose the right owner for example um a, a so-called dog of low intelligence if that's the right word um probably wouldn't be found in a uh, in a home of so-called accountants if mum and dad were accountants. We're yeah. talking to an ex-accountant here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm, I'm sure There's you'll nothing animal. unintelligent about us. No. But I, that, that's through my experience. That's what seems to happen. The animals are usually um, can relate to, a, not on all occasions, but many occasions to their owner's so-called intelligence, to yeah. their owner's. Uh, awakenings and yeah um and usually if they're it, it just just depends of course i mean each and then i've said that and i can think of three things that weren't quite right about that with regards to certain animals are in the wrong so-called spectrum and that's why people ask is it okay to give away your pet you've had it for five years from the very beginning well 99 times out of 100 i found they're ready to move on not only is the owner had so-called enough of their bad habits, but their so-called bad habits are a reason for them to move on to another household where those bad habits would be appreciated and respected and the animal can really truly um, live a more so-called advanced awakening than the original house. That's mm. happened quite a few times. Mm. And I've been to one house and then gone back to their new house and they're just this different different animals they're not doing the so-called silly things they did in the first place and a lot to do with the energies of the household different um animals connect to different vibrations and react in many cases accordingly and it's um and it varies from household to household we're strictly talking about pets yeah. But um, yeah. And in, in your book, what sort of what's the name of your book? If people want to, I oh, know buy that. Oh, sorry. No, they're just three one hundred page books that I've scribbled down notes. I used to in the early days keep notes of every place place I saw, and mm -hmm. tell the story and and write out the reason why I was there, that they've been filed away somewhere safe. But there's probably 300 different stories of the reasons you get called to various situations in a household with regards to their animals. Sounds and like I, a story of Greg Bushell, isn't it? Like, <laughs> yes. Like a story of Anne yeah. Frank. Could be worth something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, there's um, everyone's different. You know, I'll go to an, um, a lady. Um, uh, comes to one of my meditation classes and she she lives on a mountain and this animal is the most and it lives amongst um, kangaroos um, birds and is the most docile most beautiful dog and it it just lives in this forest of animals with it um, and obviously with its um, owners and it's almost like it's got the energy and the connection to it almost connects with the trees this particular animals they've it's about 15 years old it's um 
it's a, uh, a, a black and white dog can't think of the name yeah and so intelligent and it's just so peaceful it's and it when the lady comes to the meditation classes we put it in the yard here and we're lucky enough to give it a pat and it's like almost patting a tree it is just so this magnificent vibration of nature because it, it never sees other uh so-called pet animals it just lives with the the kangaroos and the birds and it's almost like it's picked up this energy of this fabulous land and they live on so many acres in on the top of a mountain right here on the gold coast and uh and so the animals they can actually convert into that perfection you know they just and another animal that maybe lives in suburbia would not have that connection or that vibration that energy and um this this guy is just yeah and that's what happens with animals they connect not only to their to their owners but when they're left at a certain length of time in a particular area they'll pick up almost like the energy of the land the perfection of the rainforest where these people live and these are just some of the some of the attributes of animals you know they just yeah we've got a lot to learn so greg um Julia's um, background is in Qigong. She runs classes in the West End Parks. Yeah. Uh, West right. Park there on a Saturday morning, nine o'clock. Um, yeah. And Qigong and Tai Chi, they're all about um, movement of the body. And, of course, you know, Tai Chi was well recognised for individuals you know, mastered the art of, of animals and the way they, they move. Um, and so that influence has sort of come through the Asian lifestyle and now we've got julia sort of revealing that to the to the public <laughs> down there in west end so I was actually yeah. going to pick up on that jeff thanks for uh, mentioning that because tai chi is actually based on observing a crane and a snake fight oh wow of course so um, the snake is all about the squeezing and the rolling of the joints and being grounded in the earth energy, whereas the crane is all about uh, using the bones and the wings and um, the connection of the heavenly energies. You know, it's usually white. But I, I was going to ask you, have you talked to any snakes? What, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. What have snakes good. told you? Yeah, we had this <laughs> conversation before you came on. Actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, sorry. No, that's okay. But, it's a beautiful story. Yeah, uh, a chap. Do you want me to repeat it? Yeah, go on. No, no, yeah. it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll I'll, That's I'll a watch it later. Story. Yeah, all right, Jeff says. Oh. Okay, but um, I will mention many a few years ago. Now it was about eleven o'clock on a Tuesday night, and a really rain was pouring down rain here, and somebody. I had this phone call from a, people I never knew before, and it, they lived up um, Corumban Valley, right up the end of Corumban Valley, and they said. Oh, our calf is sick can you come and see it and i thought <laughs> i know i'd be stupid enough to go out 11 o'clock on a tuesday night in the pouring rain so we went up i went for the drive and and it was this calf um in this driveway and it was about the owners having for them to have the confidence to heal the animal it was about the owners once again and even if they didn't want to touch, they were just supposed to sit beside it and just send energy to the cow, uh, this calf, and and blow me down. I went and saw them the next day in the light, and we went through it again, and this calf came good. And one of the times, the next weekend, we went up there on a whenever Sunday afternoon, and we're all the calf was quite happy to sit amongst us, and watch it come along, but a green snake, a tree snake, and and we every time we went to this healing process this green tree snake would be around so and it was just an energy i never really picked up what was going on but it was just an energy of a pure energy of light that wanted to be present they're just some of the things that come forth hmm. Well, thanks for sharing that because we used to do meditations up at kenmore anglican church and um to walk through you'd have to go across grass and one night there was a big commotion because there was a big green snake 
Yeah, right. <laughs> I was crossing the road and um, yeah, it would freak out other people, but I wasn't. You know, snakes are snakes. But, um, so with animals, what, humans can heal them just by laying on hands? Sitting uh, with well, them, sending them energy? Yeah, I, I believe so. These particular um, husband and wife, they were once again one of those people that lived in a particular area for many, many years and were very much connected to the land and their animals. Uh, I don't know if um, I'm sure, and they had this great respect and love for their animals and the land, and I think it was just a matter of them being told from an independent source that they can very much assist their animals by their love and connection via just simply giving, simply allowing the animal to draw through them, through them whatever energy they require. Hmm. It's not for everybody, but those who wish to connect to these so-called understandings, the opportunity is there hmm. in many cases. Hmm. So I guess it's, it's actually really nice because um, often it's the other way around, isn't it, that the animals will put their head near where the owner has got an illness and draw it out for them. Mm. It's lovely to hear you say that we can actually do it the other way around, that we can help them and uh, supplement their energy or channel channel uh, universal energies that will help them. Of course. Yeah, most certainly. Most certainly. Yes, that, that's come through a few times. Um, and a, a lot to do with when I see people with regards to the um, – uh, uh horses they're they're quite often the owners are, have done reiki or something or not even necessarily reiki but have an urge to to heal and have that vibration and they just like the touch and they'll draw through the touch from the the owners hmm. comes through quite often and children too uh those children that are connected um, to to the land they know that they love the the freedom and the where they where they live and uh, in many cases the kids are great great healers too fantastic yeah very much so mm. well i've been listening to you greg and and i sense somewhere along the line there that these animals are showing humanity um a part of their journey that they've forgotten is almost like they're being clouded you know like in the sense that we're coming to these urban environments and we've got bitumen we've got concrete wherever we can and what you're really saying is that the animals particularly when that you're telling the story about the snake and um or the snakes when the guy um had them as pets and they came to you and they said they just miss the vibrancy of going through the earth and feeling that vibration and going around the trees and stuff and it was very fortunate that guy came to that conclusion to release them. Mm. That mm. you say so you've spoken about that, and then you we've spoken about qi gong and tai chi, and there's an aspect that humans have studied animals, and we've also it's, it's come to the point where historically we've talked about um, our Aboriginal people talking about the song lines and clearing the song lines for the the energy path. For, to have that cleared and where it's been densed and cleared, densed up by abattoirs or other killing fields of humans and stuff. And it's almost like to look after the planet, one really needs to get back in touch with the earth itself and, and its own vibration. And so making that connection, whether it's bare feet, whether it's swimming in the oceans or swimming in a creek or walking through a rainforest, um, it seems to be a whole sense of connection and I, I i'm drawn to that movie avatar which just went gangbusters with humanity and yeah whilst it was a big box off the success it just resonated with so many on this planet the connection with the land and so um th that's what i'm hearing from our talk tonight that sometimes humanity needs to just step back and um lip dream the new dream isn't it in a perfect world, we'd all um, some every month spend three or four days in the bush and just walk around barefooted and and just watch the trees and watch the animals and watch the bugs, the insects and and there's more to that nine to five world where we sit in the office and look at a computer. 
I think it would bring a lot more peace into most of our worlds if we could do that. Yeah, so we're operating at a different present. frequency now, aren't we? I mean, the Earth, going out in nature and all this stuff operates on Earth frequency, but we've more or less gone into an electronic mechanical frequency of, of industrial industrialization and computer technology and, and radiation mm. patterns and so forth. So, so the sense of going back into nature mm. brings you, heals your soul, heals your physical body, heals your emotional body. You know? Never true a word said. So yeah. true. Yeah. So one of our listeners has just um, written an interesting question that I'd actually really be interested to hear what you think of it. Yeah. Do animals have their own Maslow hierarchy? So the Maslow hierarchy is the you know the, the triangle of needs that have to be met. Animals in general is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. Well, I think you're parallels of the human race and the animal kingdom. Eh? Oh, okay. Um, look, I honestly can't answer that. I'm, mainly, my work's been done with pets, um, and only so-called herds of cows and. Um, and when I've connected with herds of cows, they haven't suggested that there's a um, there's a buffalo over the back that that's so called more advanced than them, so to speak. I, I, I can't honestly answer that. I don't know. Um, in a in a family situation with uh, th say three dogs, um, they're all different personalities, and I think they're a bit like us. Some have got more so called outgoing, powerful. Um, ex, um, characteristics than others, but I wouldn't suggest that for one minute that a, a blue cattle dog was smarter than a, a golden retriever or vice versa. Not to my knowledge. They've, I've seen little bits of um, sausage dogs that have been most have connected to most profound experiences, um, and 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 as far as healing animals are concerned whether they be cats um, or dogs, they all seem to be very much connected to their owners' um, wishes, so to speak, and vice versa. But I'm sorry, I can't answer the other one. Yeah, no, thank you for that. So what, what, are, if, what would be three things that any owner that's uh, listening could, could do for their pet, you know, based on all the experiences you've had from pets talking to you when there's been a situation? What are the three things that owners can do for their pets to make them happy? Um, uh, uh, the, the most important one of the lot is the communication, the love, the touch between the owner and the pet. Um, and same as us, some animals love to be touched all day, every day, and others don't. And I think it's just the most important is for the owner to respect that Certain animals, yes, they want to be patted and touched as much as possible, and others don't. And just, um, and they'll soon, the animals soon put two and two together. If the cat doesn't like to be patted before breakfast or after after a meal, but, um, and the other one, I suppose you watch their food habits. They'll, they'll let you know with their food habits if they're not taking, um, as much food as they should or they're overdoing it. I think it's, that's, yeah, but most important is the love between the the owner and the pet. That's that's what it's all about. And um, and exercise. A lot of times, it is exercise. It's common sense. If it's a great big dog in a very short, small yard, it's be nice to exercise the animals. Um, and then again, it's they're like us. Some animals love exercise. Some do. Some don't. And just be aware of how they react to different situations. Do they want a five-kilometre walk or do they want a 100-yard run? You know, they, we soon put it together. They'll let us know the way they react. Hmm. So when you work on that, I suppose it's the love, the food and exercise, if that's pretty well what they're about. And that's love, food and exercise is what makes them happy. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, yes. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> Sounds like there's a dog loose. Yeah, there's talking. a dog next door. He's going woof woof. <laughs> this is joining. <laughs> it's 
So we've got Alison Dickinson saying hi to you. Good morning, Jeff. Yeah, I reckon you must know her. UK. Alison Dickinson. Yeah, from the UK. From the UK. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, they're all here. Her whole tribe. Her whole family, all humans, they're all healers. Fantastic. Oh, Pete's, he's a muso too. He's into it. Oh, good. Carry on. Hmm. <laughs> so the Tom baby's talking us. He's been seeing some stuff for you, eh? He knows a lot about cows. He's spent lots of time watching cows. So he's saying cows less stress produce more milk. Oh, is that right, eh? The, I'm sorry, the question was cows that are stressed produce more milk. No, less. Yeah, it's just a comment that if they're, if they're less stressed, then they produce more milk, or if they are stressed, they produce less milk. So. I suppose it's understandable. I've, I've never really connected much with dairy cattle, to be honest. I don't know, but I suppose it makes sense, doesn't it? If it's um, it's a bit like us. If we're not stressed, we'll yeah, yeah. Um, play a better <laughs> game of tennis than if we were stressed. Happy wife, happy life. Happy <laughs> All right, or right, back to animals. <laughs> <laughs> what are the biggest stress factors for pets, Greg? Jim. <laughs> Jeff would <laughs> know. <laughs> I, I, I would think um, very, very much connected to disharmony in the household. Disharmony in the household. Hmm. So they're like children, basically. Children hate it when parents argue. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, you'll find that many of the animals that we know of, they are in actual fact, brought into a household to balance the energies. Quite often we get animals that balance the energies in the house um, through so-called conversations and arguments. It's a big thing. That, and, and if you, those who have those households with animals, they'll realise if the two kids bite that the dog's always in between them. And, and mum and dad will say, yeah, it's almost like they're trying to break up the fight, the argument, the yelling screaming and these animals are there to balance an energy it's almost like they do just that hmm. yeah yeah we used to have a golden cocker spaniel and um he just joined us at just the right time and he was just wonderful for ba balancing out he was just so happy he was just the most, most contented dog He'd just lie on his side and the kids could brush him and pet him mm. and he was just there to, just to be that beautiful golden energy Oh, yeah, I yeah. know what you're. I know what you're talking about, Greg. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's many of those beautiful animals around. Yeah, and the next animal would just be there for the for mum who does facials at home. You know, they'll always be there to bring in an energy to the clients. You know, oh, for the clients, yeah. I was trying to work that one out. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Now, Greg, you charge you charge eighty dollars an hour, don't you? So um, people can make a yeah, yeah. And just come and see you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the plan. Yeah, if the, the people usually we can assist with some um, answers to what's going on in their world. Usually, yeah. There's um, there's usually uh, there's usually an answer to um, and it's not always the obvious answer that that it may be. Um, a lot of people forget that, um, that just behind the fence in their so-called house is another family. And quite often your animals, your so-called animals, are very much aware of what goes on in the neighbour's place. And they also do their work, in many cases, balance through the fence. Um, and uh, it's amazing what, how often the your so-called animal is interested in your neighbours, not affairs, but their vibration and their energies, and they'll they'll assist your neighbours. Mm. Mm. So, have you done pet detective stuff? You know, like finding missing pets. Yeah, I used to do a bit of that. We had a bit of success with that. Um, I had a free time some year or two ago and we used to spend a lot of our weekends um, 
driving around looking for so-called miss pets and um, we used to have a few lovely coincidences unfold yeah there was um i remember we went the first one we did this lady rang and said um my cat's gone never never leaves my side um but it's gone where could it be so we i drove out to wherever a suburb here and uh i said oh it's upside down and she said how could it be upside down i said i don't know so we walked around the suburb and the poor thing was in a wheelie bin it was yeah. unfortunately passed over yeah it had been run over as we found out later and um a neighbor just put it in the bin they didn't know who the cat belonged to so not always the um outcomes are perfect but um other times they're simple they we've had a few where they're just simply under a neighbor's house um for whatever reason um and then there was oh it goes on and on a lot of the a lot of the um and then another time there was i remember there was this lady she um she'd been looking for a for another cat for three years and um she got me out three times in a three weekends in a row to drive around the suburbs to to try and connect and the cat had been in many of the suburbs but we never ever found her it was just mm. who knows don't know but um yeah so it, hmm, don't always get the result that the owner was before you know? mm. So it's it's not like in the Disney movies where you know one dog barks and tells the next dog dog in the next neighbourhood, you know the bush the dog telegraph. <laughs> so, so when you go missing, you just talk to the neighbour's dog and get him to. What a good idea! Look, I, that's out of my realm. I don't know about that. You haven't I'm sorry. thought of that yet, Craig. Yeah, yeah, that was. Hmm, have to look into that well, one. Mind you, they all go off, don't they? When when you go for a morning walk, one will start. Yeah. Yeah. And all the way down the track, they're all bloody saying, "Hey, what are you doing on my patch?" You know? Yeah, yeah. Sure. You feel like by saving a bottle of um of pee and putting a bottle and just go along and just mark your <laughs> just 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 do an April Fool's on them, isn't it? Yeah, marking the better. church and hey, I'm here, mate. <laughs> That'd be one way to approach it. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Hey, um, geese, geese. Yep. Anything in that area of um, farm animals? Uh, that's uh, I haven't. I'm sorry. No, I've never, never ventured that path. Um, because they're really uh, a bunch of security animal, aren't they? They they get around there and they can protect the whole farm, can't they? They're really um, yeah, they're wonderful animals, eh? Of course, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know about that. I must admit, um, I don't know why, but I just thought of um, we went to the races one day. And we thought we'll back a few winners by talking through the horses. Did <laughs> <laughs> that work? <laughs> I know. They're all so bloody full of energy and yeah. oof, they're just jumping out of their skin. Obviously, one could only suggest that they were full of vitamin pills or whatever they were on, you know. And uh, But no, I couldn't back a winner all day. No. <laughs> Lost. Lost on that one. Mm. Yeah, very. So it wasn't. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't pre previously. It wasn't fixed. The match. <laughs> they didn't know no. who was going to win by the sounds of it. No, no, no. We were, we thought it'd be a good idea if we could rig a couple of races, but we couldn't. Nothing happened. Not a thing. No. No, were just animals that were so excitable that you could hardly even get through to them. They. No, they were just, hyper. Yeah. Very hyper. Very hyper. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in their own world. Mm. Yeah. Do you get any um, where you are? Um, you're down there in West Burley Road, aren't you? So, um, yeah. The people sort of know where you are on the Gold Coast. So, it's at the Peace Mojo Centre, is that how you pronounce yeah, it? Yeah, Peace, Peace Yoga. Yeah, where they do all the um, meditations here, the, the yoga, three different yoga classes each day. And there's also Luke, the, um, the owner here. He's a a doctor of chiropractor he's a chiropractor he's here also yeah it's so a beautiful peace yoga or peace mojo what, what do you call it uh, peace, uh, peace yoga 
Peace Yoga Centre. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Run by um, Doreen and David Scales. Yeah, Doreen has been a yoga instructor for many, many years. You'd be similar. Oh, much younger than me, but yeah, and very popular, very popular. Yeah, yeah. That's 88 West Burley Road, more so down the James End Street. Um, yeah, halfway between James Street and the Stockland Shopping Centre. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And yeah. they just get hold of you. They just ring you up. Or some ring place. Up. Uh, here we go. We just put that back up. You make an appointment yeah. with Greg for his Facebook site there. Yeah. Every dot pushal dot thirty one. Um, there you go. Yeah. And I make an appointment, eighty dollars first appointment, and if you need to come back second or third, it's negotiable. Yeah. yeah, of course, of course. Should I give my phone number or? Hang on a sec, I'll just. Uh, yeah, we can do that, but just hang on a sec, I'll. Um, okay. Hang on. Here. Okay, is that going to be a landline or a mobile? Uh mobile. Okay. Go for it. 04. 03. 125 375. I can do, um, we do a lot of um, interstate stuff. People can just ring and we do it over the phone. I do. Really? Yeah, yeah, do a lot of that. And there's no, there's not as expensive by the phone. We don't charge as much. So what the, the client just takes the phone and puts it to the cow's mouth or. <laughs> <laughs> or the rabbit's ear. <laughs> they could do that, but usually they just, as long as they, they've got a photo of the animal and they're looking at the photo, oh, yeah, you can yeah, do it yeah. by the photo. Yeah. Yeah. Seems to work okay. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Pet detective work, mm. isn't it? Another aspect of the energy, isn't it? So, Greg's the animal channel, the, you know, the national national pet directory. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah on 5G, baby. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, 5G. We, we should get you doing a with Twitter, opening a Twitter account, and you should just put on the Twitter feed what the animals are telling you. <laughs> so, okay. say, you know, Mikey says, "Stop giving me that bone." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes it's as simple as that. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, the coyote might come on and say, "Well, Disney gave me a bum rap following the Roadrunner." <laughs> <laughs> who knows mate hey um, yeah. you've got to have fun in the afternoon and I'm sure um, that's part of your medicine and when um, owners come to you that looking a bit forlorn they're a bit reserved and um, and your role along with the animals to bring some jovility into it get some laughter happening and that humour happening just to break the ice yeah, well, there's yeah, all different approaches. They're never two are the same. They're always, always, um, and ninety percent of the time, the animals love. So often, when especially on their so-called um, dying, so-called word last words to the owners before they take them to the vet, they always suggest they they really so enjoyed when such and such was laughing. That was the joy in their life was when a certain household member laughed and it's usually they're the so-called grumpy ones that never laugh but when they did laugh the animals remembered it oh, and right. yeah yeah that happens so often mm. and um yeah mm. yeah they've always um it's interesting the last when they have their so-called loss communication the last of the communication with the owners when they know they're going to the vet the next day or so there and they it's not always what the so-called owner would expect but it makes them certainly think about their individual lives of what they've in many cases been lacking in a lot of times it's laughter mm. which brings joy to so many in the house you know Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Is there anything that Julian and I have overlooked that we should have asked you that needs to be said? No, I think that's great. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about my silly world. 
<laughs> oh, it's profound, Greg. And um, hopefully, I do encourage you to, you know, get somebody to type up those three exercise books, and hopefully, we can have you on the show. Oh, yeah, the book. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure lots of people would love to read about them. Sure, hey, um, this is a matter of interest. So, you are you running some classes there for for um, young kids to come and learn? Uh, well, I do meditation classes here at four o'clock on Sundays, twelve o'clock on Thursdays, and six thirty Friday nights. Just, and that's I ask everybody what they want to get out of the meditation, and we move to an area of depth that they're ready to connect with to begin to move the blocks that's stopping them achieving their so-called dreams. And we do it via meditation, via vibration. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So what age group are we talking about here? Um, oh, usually, usually young adults to people my age, yeah, and everybody in between. Everybody still seems to have a dream or something they so-called missed out on. And we can still get there. We can still do it via the mm, lifting to parts of the awakening process that they haven't quite been to, but they will get there with time. What did you call it, Julia? Late bloomers or something? What did you say today? Late bloomers <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Late bloomers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, um, I did have a question that I it disappeared now it's come back to the forefront of my mind and that was um how indigenous people have animals as a totem yeah do you find this connection with Australia and its own animals completely different to how the indigenous people of America would see animals as well as their own people here in Australia I have the greatest of respect for the Aboriginals. Their energy, their vibration, their connection to Mother Earth is absolutely, we've got so much to learn from them, so many gifts that they've almost forgotten about. And I've actually been lucky enough to channel one or two of their so-called, I so-called awakenings, and it truly is fantastic with regards to the awakening process that they unfold via their culture and it's similar but different i've found with the red indians um our to the best of my knowledge and the way i interpret it our aboriginals um from the beginning have a almost a deeper understanding of the land even are uh, different but similar to the red indian very very very, very intense. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Hmm. Another, that's another whole new experience. I know. So do you have a, a certain animal that comes to you? I mean, or, or crop of animals that come to you in your sleep state or in, in your dream state? No, none at all. Mm. I go out of my way not to um, read or get involved with any other so-called communicators, animal communicators. So what I bring through, whether it be via um, animal work or vibrational work i'm not influenced by anybody or anything else it's my i stay well away books and things which probably means why i lack a bit of intelligence along the way but i bring it through my way hmm. right or wrong that's the way it is yeah. yeah thanks guys oh yeah there he is as his details um doesn't matter where you're on the planet you can get them on facebook link up with them um Alternatively, in Australia, it's um, 04, it's a local number. Overseas, you'd have to dial um, your area code, which will be 61, and drop off to zero. Julia, uh, what do you think, mate? That's, uh... I think that's wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Greg, and sharing I've, um, yeah, what you said about the um, animals. Um, giving that feedback about their most precious moments with the families really, you know, really touched my, touched my heart and makes me very thankful to the animals that I've had in my life. Yes, they were there for a reason, weren't they? Mm. Mm. Very much so. Mm. 
thanks for your energy sky that was beautiful thank you all right yeah. good night everyone thanks for watching next week we have jeff remind me there he is i'll just put him up here mr jared oh Biddy. there you go there you go orgain affects australia so it's all about um radiation patterns around 5g it's got it's quite an exponent on the knowledge of 5g isn't it? hello yeah it'll be really interesting <laughs> it'll be really interesting <laughs> because jeff will be doing all the talk because as a radio man he understands radio waves <laughs> i know i'm scared of 5g but anyway jared's gonna tell us <laughs> what it is because he's gone and measured the stuff and <laughs> And he's invented stuff to deal with it. So um, we no longer have to catastrophize. We'll have Gerard online next week on Thursday and he will tell us in yeah, quantifiable go, terms. You won't have to go and uh, Faraday cage. <laughs> he's got his own simple techniques. Yeah. Hey, um, it's great. Um, lovely to see you. I mean, it's taken three years to catch up, Greg, but. Um, Next time we're down the Burley Heads, I'll give you a tingle and pop in for a cuppa. Yeah. That'd be lovely, mate. I look forward to it. Get down to that Harry Krishna cafe down there in James Street. Get that big Absolutely. Tune. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. place. Yeah. Thanks, right. heaps. All right. Love Thanks, you all. Thanks for watching, yeah. everyone. Have a lovely evening or day. Okay, bye. See ya.